Hey guys, this episode needed a couple of trigger warnings, so make sure you listen to those um, and make sure you're all good to listen to the section of the video that I'm talking about here. Um, The trigger warnings are definitely for rape and racism and then also violence um, motivated by racism, so very sad topics, but it does come into play with one of the lakes that we're talking about today, which is Lake Lanier. So if you are sensitive to those topics, go ahead and skip over that section of the video, which starts at a about four minutes um, and ends at around 18 minutes. Those are rough estimates, so just make sure you just skip over Lake Lanier if those topics are triggering to you, and I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the episode. Welcome back to another episode of All Things Ghostly. I did not let myself slip into the British accent just then. I stopped myself. Anyway, welcome back to another episode. I repeat myself a lot. What is new? Um, Today, we have an exciting video because we are talking about some haunted lakes. Um, I am reading this book right now, which I forget what it's called, but it's like the cabin across the street, the the house across the lake or something like that. It's by Riley Sager, I think the name is. I forget, but basically it involves a spooky lake, a haunted lake, a mysterious lake. And so I was just really inspired to do this video ASAP because I'm finishing that book now and it's really interesting. So, uh, like I keep saying, I am starting a lot of like haunted series currently. Obviously, we're still very new uh, into the podcast and I'm just starting all the haunted series. Um, Haunted is the series, just a haunted different thing all the time. Um, So we're doing Haunted Lakes today and we've got three um, and I'm excited about this because water is just creepy. I don't know. I feel like it holds a lot of secrets. Um, They always say like never go on a cruise because it's extremely easy to get away with murdering somebody on a cruise because um, something about like you can just throw them off board very easily and there's other things that I saw from a TikTok so don't don't make it sound credible but uh, yeah I just feel like water holds a lot of secrets, a lot of dirty, dirty secrets. So let's just get on into it because let's cut to the chase. Now, I will say this is the last video of 2022, guys. The year's really going to be over. I'm sad. Tear. Just kidding. I'm ready for a new year. I'm ready for bigger, better, badder, more successful. (laughs) I I couldn't think of another B word. Um, So yeah, I'm actually really excited for the new year to start. I hope your guys' holidays all went very good. I hope that your new year is going to bring you anything and everything you've been manifesting and wishing for and all that jazz. Um, So yeah, let's get into the haunted lakes. I don't know why I'm doing that. The first one we're going to talk about um, is called Lake Lanier. And I have heard of this before. Um... But I don't know a ton about it. Very just surface level that it was a spooky type of lake. Um, So yeah, let's read about it. Uh, This article, all these articles will be linked in whatever description of wherever you're listening or watching. Um, But this description, this description, (laughs) this article is from OxfordAmerican.org. Just in case you're curious. So it is entitled The Haunting of Lake Lanier. Uh, A restless energy seized the air. It was March 2020, right after schools began shutting down to due to covid due to due to covid um and a friend and i were hiking laurel ridge trail a four mile loop along the southern rim of lake sydney linear i didn't know that it was called lake sydney linear anyway um a sprawling amo amobia amoba i don't know what that is amoba i don't know uh the man-made lake built in 1956 for flood control drinking water and hydroelectric power touches five country counties in north georgia i'm struggling i just filmed uh, an episode recorded an episode and now i'm like jabber jaw i can't i can't speak um it is named after a 19th century georgia poet sydney sydney lanier whose poem song of the 
Catahoochee is an ode to the river that feeds it. I had just canceled two trips out of town, and my friend whose father had passed away in England a couple days earlier had recently uh, returned from settling his affairs. Okay, th- let me jump to more so the, like, the spookiness. Okay, Lake Lanier, the largest lake in Georgia, is one of the deadliest in the U.S. since its formation. Uh, Sorry, since its formation, 500 people have died there, nearly 200 since 1994. About 11 million visitors descend upon its shore every year, about the same number as visit, about the same number uh, that visits the Louvre. The Louvre? The Louvre. The Louvre. I don't know. (laughs) But the lake's popularity doesn't explain the high number of fatalities. Uh, Lake Alatoona, sure, 40 miles to the west, receives close to the same number of visitors every year, but has only one-third of the deaths. Drownings or motor vessel accidents are usually are the usual culprits. There is no upward or downward trend, and no way to predict year after year how many vic- how many victims the reservoir reservoir will claim. Sadly, what many of these deaths increasingly have in common is the race of the victims. Wow, I did not know that. Uh, the lake is a popular recreation spot for Georgia's Latinx community who primarily hail from the Hall County on the eastern shore, which is now 28% Latinx, um, as well as the Atlanta metro area. One explanation for the high number of fatalities lies beneath the surface. Debris and rubble from the from before the lake's construction, as well as everything from sunken boats to lawn tra- chairs to fishing wire, create a treacherous underwater obstacle course. This, coupled with the lake's low visibility, makes rescue operations dangerous. But there's another theory for the body count. Legend has it that Lake Lanier is haunted. Uh, the perpetrators vary. Some blame spirits for the graves of, from, wait, some blame spirits from the graves, the corpse of engineers never located in 1956. Others fault the phantoms of the 27 victims who have died over the years at the lake, but whose body were never successfully recovered. The most famous ghost story known as Lady of the Lake, which I have heard about this, uh, reigns supreme in these parts. In 1956, or 1958, sorry, two friends, Delia Mae Parker Young and Susie Roberts, departed a dance. After getting gas and skipping out on paying for it, they skidded off a bridge while crossing the lake and disappeared. The following year, a fisherman came across a decomposed, unidentifiable body floating near one of the bridges. It wasn't until 1990, over three decades later, that officials discovered a 1950s Ford sedan with remains belonging to Roberts, which meant that the body found way back in 1959 must have belonged to her friend Parker Young. Locals didn't need a forensic analyst to know this, analysis, sorry, to know this. They had seen Parker Young themselves, wearing a blue dress she had borrowed that night from Roberts, uh, wandering near the bridge. With her handless arms, the story goes, she snatches unsuspecting lake goers and drags them to the bottom. That's scary. Um... I had no idea Lake Lanier was lethal the first few years I lived in Georgia. I was simply taken in by its beauty. On sunny days, it's spectacular. Thickets of lush green groves, mainly oaks and hickories, encircle the blue water. Uh, 160 small islands, hilltops too high for the corpse of engineers to have submerged, crest over the surface. It is a vibrant and diverse ecosystem, especially on the southern end. Latinx, Asian, and Black visitors fill the surrounding parks. Every summer, our our family joins them. We toss towels and flotation devices into the car and head to the crescent beach of Buford Dam Park. The crisp savory scent of barbecue wafts through the air. I hate barbecue. Sorry if that's controversial. Frisbees and picnic baskets blanket the grassy knolls. Uh, Geese and ducks waddle along them. Sorry, among them. I am struggling heavily, heavily today um, in search of leftovers. The swimming hole far from any boating area is calm. The sand underfoot soft. My three daughters have spent hours splashing in the clear shallow water and trying to catch fish that encircle their feet when they were little 
they'd build towers with plastic buckets and write their names with sticks on the shore. We'd stay as long as we could until our skin withered and pruned, um, until the last handful of grapes was consumed and the sun gave way to the moon. Um, let me see. Okay, this is more about like what happened here. When 11-year-old Kyle Gro Glover, uh, the stepson of R&B singer Usher, died from injuries he suffered when a jet ski collided with his inner tube. After this horrific incident, I began talking sorry, taking a hard look into other deaths, the dozens of collisions, the drownings of swimmers who disappeared after jumping in, and the drivers who rode their vehicles into the lake. Our family does not boat jet ski or tube at Lake Lanier. We never even visited the lake's water park. Our radius extends only to designated swimming areas or trails. Still, when I learned how many people died, it was difficult for me to reconcile what seemed like such a serene place with so much tragedy. Uh, lake Lanier's uh, tragic history can be traced back long before it became a lake. Forsyth County, which sits on the western side, was once part of the Cherokee Nation. In the 1830s, the U.S. government expulsed most of its members from what would be one of the southeasternmost origins of the Trail of Tears. Fuck the government. Uh, don't come for me. Anyway, a second expul expulsion occurred 80 years later, this time involving a different community. Here's the thing. I cannot see how any government of any sort, of any type of person, doesn't even have to be fucking government. Um, why you think you can just take people out of their freaking home? I know this isn't anything new. I know this isn't anything that we haven't heard of, but it still doesn't make it right. And this is constantly so irritating to hear about. Um, because what the fuck? Like, come on, let people have their homes. You can't just take it when you want something. Anyway. Up until 1912, some 1,000 black people owned land and operated businesses in Forsyth, Forsyth County. That fall, on September 9th, an 18-year-old white man named May Crow was raped and murdered close to Browns Bridge on the banks of the Chattahoochee River. I hope I'm saying that right. In a village called Oscarville. Uh, the crimes were pinned on four young black people who happened to live nearby. Of course it was. Uh, they were 16-year-old Ernest Knox, his 18-year-old cousin Oscar Daniel, 22-year-old Trussie Jane Daniel, I guess Jane is her nickname, uh, Oscar's sister, and 24-year-old Robert Big Rob Edwards. The day after Edward's arrest, a white mob invaded his jail cell. He was shot, dragged through the streets, and hanged from a telephone pole just outside the co courthouse in Cumming, the, con the county seat. I'm speechless. Uh, Crow's death and Ed Edward's lynching... Um, began more violence. White mobs known as night riders went door to door with torches and guns, burning down black churches and businesses. And that's the solution? What the? Mm, I'm getting angry. This is not how you deal with things. This is absolutely not how you deal with things. First of all, when somebody is raped, abused, assaulted, murdered, whatever the case may be, you can't just pin it on somebody because you fucking want to. You have to look into it. You have to 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 find proof that it happens. Nobody wants a victim's perpetrator to go unpunished, but you can't just punish the first person you see just because you think that their life is less than than yours or the next person that that's on the sus suspect list. That's not how we do things. Anyway, sorry. Uh, let me see. Demanding that all black residents of Forsyth, Forsyth County vacate immediately. The residents quickly abandoned their land, their crops, their homes, and most of their belonging, and the whites picked over and pillaged what remained. Great. I hope you feel proud of that. I hope you feel damn good that you took away all these people's homes, their businesses, their successes, their life, because you feel entitled to it. Then in October, a jury took a little over an hour to convict Ernest Knox and Oscar Daniel for Crow's killing. Trussie Daniel's charges were dismissed. 5,000 people gathered to watch these two teenage boys be hanged. It is widely, widely believed that Edward Knox and Daniel were innocent of the crime. I'm sure that they were. I'm absolutely positive that they were because from what this article says, there was absolutely no digging into what actually happened. It was just because they lived nearby and they were black. Cool. 
When Lake Lanier was formed in the 1950s, it washed over Oscarville and turned in it into an underwater ghost town, and incredibly, Forsyth County remained an all-white county for a few more decades. I hope they haunted the fuck out of all of your asses. In January 1987, Jose... I think it is. It's H-O-S-E-A. Williams, who marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Salem, Selma, Alabama. I kept wanting to read Salem. Um, In 1965, attempted to lead a unity march in Forsyth to celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. Day. He was met with white counter protesters and violence. A week later, in a second attempt, Williams was joined by Coretta Scott King, John Lewis, Jesse Jackson, and 20,000 more marchers to Cummings Courthouse. It was the largest civil rights demonstration since Dr. King's funeral in 1968. Soon thereafter, the demographics of Forsyth Forsyth County gradually began to shift. In 1990, 16 black people, uh, 635 Latinx, and 81 Asians made their homes there. While the Latinx and Asian populations have steadily grown, today black people represent only 4% of the population. Last summer, when George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis, my goodness, I can't speak. Minneapolis, Forsyth residents of all races took to the streets to peacefully protest. They rallied on Cummings Courthouse steps, the same spot where Edwards was lynched 108 years earlier. In January, two brothers, Larry Strickland and Leroy Grogan, whose grandmother was run out of the court co- county in 1912, unveiled a historical marker to honor Edwards and acknowledge the injustice of his death. Forth, Forsyth, I'm struggling with that word, uh, just like any other place in the U.S., is still struggling to reckon with its racist past because it's not just as simple as right and wrong, right? It's, anyway. But the seeds of inclusivity have been planted and are starting to take root. And while the con- county is still largely Trump country, throw up in my mouth, the election year may foreshadow the emergence of a different kind of politics. Um, The lower portion of the county, which includes coming what was once Oscarville and the southern shore of Lake Lanier falls into Georgia's 7th congressional district. As of this year, it is now represented by a Democrat congresswoman, Carolyn Bordeaux. It is this storied past Um, beginning with the Cherokee removal, to the banishment of black people in Forsyth County, to the lake's disembodied souls in search of some kind of absolution that I carry with me whatever I visit. Um, A few weeks after my trip to Laurel Ridge Trail, like the rest of the U.S., Georgia began shutting down with most restaurants and stores closed. Uh, Georgians flocked to state parks. Our governor refused to mandate masks. Great. Um, The shittiness continues. So few visitors bothered to wear them. Though I longed for another trip to Lake Lanier, the thought of crowds kept me away. Um, Let me try to find, this is like her personal um, experience at the lake. So this article kind of ends with a little bit of maybe her experience of the ghost type of stuff. So we'll go ahead and read this. When we arrived, only a few other vehicles idled in the parking lot. The beach was practically empty. We made a beeline to the far end and had a 50-foot stretch to ourselves. The girls grabbed our inner tubes and noodles and leapt into the water. I settled into a chair, dug my toes into the cool sand, and watched them act like the teens and preteens they were for the first time since the pandemic started. A light breeze tickled my shoulders. Was it merely a breeze or the lady of the lake? And what of the celestial beings lingered near the their graves deep under the water? Though I have never been one to believe, believe in ghosts, I have always believed in stories. I leaned my head back and shut my eyes. Just to be on the safe side, I attempted to bargain with the spirit world. We will hug the beach and the gentle waters that lap it but we will never cross the rope boundary of swimming in the area. The belly of the reservoir with its deep, dark waters, all of its mysteries and secrets, we will leave to the dead. They are the rightful occupants after all. Uh, The once ominous sky seemed pleasing with my offering, seemed pleased with my offering. A few minutes later, the grain is faded and it was replaced by a pink and then orange hue until at last the clouds parted so that the day's last light could finally shine through. So, um, that 
is crazy. Like, I honestly, we, I think it was in the Dark Watchers episode that we talked about how it could be the native people of that mountain, which I think was St. Lucia or something like that, um, in California, I want to say it was, um, that could be these, like, Dark Watchers that people see. It's the same concept. When you take somebody out of their home, that's where their bodies, that's where their souls, I mean, are going to linger after um, their life has been taken because that's where they were supposed to be. And honestly, I'm glad that they go back and haunt the people that are there now because most of the time it's people who just took it without it being rightfully given to them. Um, so I should have uh placed a trigger warning before this episode um which i will in like text or whatever i didn't know that lake lanier had like that intense of a history but what's new i feel like a lot of places in the u.s um have a very shitty history it's never just it's not beautiful none of our history is beautiful the way that this land came to be um so i shouldn't have been surprised but essentially there that is why there is said to be hauntings there which again what more of a reason could you need for haunting a place so um now moving on to the next haunted lake i got all heated after that one um, this is called Gardner Lake, and this is in Connecticut. It's in a place called Salem, Connecticut, so not Salem, Massachusetts. Um, Gardner Lake is a natural lake lying at the junction of the towns Salem, Montville, and Bozra, Connecticut, um, and named after the Gardner family who owned a large portion of the surrounding land. The winter of 1895 was vicious in the eastern section of Connecticut with zero, sorry, with below zero temperatures, high winds, and 10 inches of ice on rivers and lakes. Thomas LeCount, a grocer in Niantic, Niantic wanted to move his summer house from the south shore of Gardner Lake in Salem to the land he owned on the east coast. That turned out to be a bad idea. Gardner Lake is an easy 32 mile drive heading southeast from Hartford to the town of Salem. To the <laughs> to the town of Salem, according to an article in the Norwich Bulletin back in 1895, a grocer and Niantic, Niantic, I don't know how to say it, uh, named Thomas LeCount made the decision to have his house moved from the South Shore to the East Shore. He hired a contractor out of Norwich to handle the project. The contractor named Woodmancy, 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 I don't know, decided to save some money by moving the house over the ice-covered lake where we have problem, and there we have problem number one paths were shoveled, horses and cables were brought in, and a crew of men was hired. On February 13th, 1895, the work commenced, and everything went smoothly uh, with just a quarter of the way to go when the 28-ton house slid off its skids and into a snowbank. Here's my thing. If you couldn't, like, get that, they literally decided to pull a house over frozen water. Why do you think that's a good idea? I'm sorry, but like you shouldn't even step on frozen water if you don't like know how frozen it is because you could fall through. So why are we trying to push a 28 ton house across a frozen lake? Anyway, I mean, this was in the 1800s, so maybe they hadn't realized that yet. I don't know. Um, because the darkness was beginning to fall, the hired hands decided to hit the sack and plan to finish the job in the morning. That proved to be an unwise decision. On February 11th, the house was pulled onto the ice and eventually the ice began to snap, crackle, and pop, leaving the house, it partially settled below the frozen surface with the roof still showing. Uh, that's creepy. <laughs> Did I tell you this house was uh, two and a half stories and weighed 28 tons? As you can imagine, by the next morning, the house began to tip over and that's when it became a spectator sport. Tourists from all over the area climbed in their wagons to see this behemoth home slowly sink into the ice. 24 horses were brought in to try and pull the house from the grip of the uh, Gardner Lake ice. After the horses failed, a news reporter for the day of New London described the scene. The skating in the halls and sitting room was fine, but the dining room, the water, 
but in the dining room, the water reached nearly to the ceiling. A handsome sideboard is frozen solid in the room, uh, which has now been turned into a high and an ice house. Upstairs, the water has frozen in the west ends of the chambers. Uh, the plaster is all cracked and broken, never having been papered or painted. Over the years, the 28-ton house continued to float in the middle of Gardner Lake. To say the house was a tourist attraction would be an understatement. I mean, I would run to see this if it were still a thing because I feel like that's just so interesting to see. Um, it, there's this phobia which I forget what it's called, but it's like a fear of seeing things in like out of place, like in the wrong area. So even with people with um, like, what is that called? It's like thalassophobia or thalassophobia. I don't know. It's fear of like deep waters. They'll see like a boat sunk underneath um, and that'll like heighten the fear if you have this other fear of like out of place things because obviously a boat's meant to be in water but it's not supposed to be at the bottom. Um, so I feel like that would trigger this for sure. I don't think I have that but it would still be very very eerie. Um, according to an article from the Hartford current dated October 23rd 1998 people would row out to the house to sit on the windowsills or fish or dive off the roof hmm interesting interesting way of handling that um, after sitting in the middle of Gardner Lake partly submerged for several years the LeCount homestead finally disappeared from view now this is where we start to get like the haunted lore of it um as late as 1959, a doll and crockery were recovered from the damp, sunken home. Recent scuba diver explorers have also reported that many of the larger pieces of furniture remaining in the house are still in, remar in a remarkable state of preservation. Also in the house was a full-sized upright piano. Fishermen and people living on the shores of Gardner Lake have occasionally reported hearing the sounds of a distant piano wafting across the water. The piano ended up leaning against the parlor wall, just sitting there waiting for some lost soul to tick it, tickle its ivories. Um, so that's kind of like the whole spookiness to it is this piano. Um, I found a little bit of a snippet from another article, so I'm just going to read it really super quick. Um, it says, but nobody died, and the situation was more comic than frightening, so where does the ghost story come in? Well, locals have long held that at night, piano music could be heard coming from the lake. The house did, in fact, have a piano, as well as some other furnitures in it at the time that it sank. Allegedly, scuba divers in the lake have reported that portions of the house, including the piano, are still present underneath the water, and on quiet nights, music can be heard coming from the spot on the lake where the house came to rest so it's almost it it's not like an actual ghost but it's just like the eeriness of hearing a piano going off under the water i don't know how like water would affect like pushing piano keys if that makes sense um like i don't know if it would like make the piano play or if the theory is maybe that like somebody is down there pushing it maybe like the the man who lived there the what was his name thomas lecount or something like that or if he had family that lived with him which i don't think he did because it didn't mention it but maybe he is back to like do 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 um but yeah just definitely very eerie imagine just like chilling on a lake and then you hear this very creepy <laughs> piano music coming out from under the water and again it's just one of those things that's not meant to be there so it's like, oh my gosh, I hear piano music. And the people who don't know about this story, it would definitely creep them out because, I mean, obviously you're just hearing piano music from under the water. But we are on to our last lake. Um, and it is called Haunted Lake. Um, I've also heard it be called Scoby Lake, I think is how it's pronounced. Um, and it's in Francistown, New Hampshire. Um... And it's named after David Scobie, who built a grist mill in the area. So, the pond is, despite its moniker, a rather picturesque place, rather like a place I worked once, a remote and quiet beautiful lake with the dreadful name of Hellhole Reservoir. I guess it has a bunch of names, though. Um, like Haunted Pond, Scobie Pond, Haunted Lake, and I guess Hellhole Reservoir. I haven't heard that one um, until this story or this article. Um, but that is a story for another time. 
There are a number of explanations as to how the pond came to be named Haunted Lake, and the one that is unfortunately most likely true is that a fire burned in the area at some point prior to 1753, when the diary of Matthew, Matthew Patton refers to it as Haunted Lake, and the burned out and skeletal looking remains of trees suggested to the settlers that the place had an eerie and otherworldly nature. However, there are other possible origins for the name, and for these, go to blah blah. It's just another article. Uh, one story holds that the children, and likely grandchildren, of David Scobie made tremendous sport out of running about in the dark to frighten people, described delightfully in the history as liquor-laden loafers by pretending to be spirits and monsters. Given that a similar thing seems to be the origin of ghost stories at California's Rispin Mansion, I have to admit to a fondness over this explanation. That said, the Scobie boys weren't active until the 1780s at the earliest, and as noted above, the lake was referred to as Haunted Lake by 1753. So while this may have kept the name going, the name likely inspired the Scobie boys and was probably not inspired by their antics. Um, Another story says that two travelers bought land in the area and in the 1740s traveled to the area, starting out separately but eventually meeting and traveling together. One night while camping near or on the shore of the pond they fought and one killed the other. Wow. Uh, the murders gave the victim a half-hearted burial and left the body. When Matthew Patton, a land surveyor, was sent out to perform surveys of the area, he and his chain men, people who assisted the surveyor by using chains that helped to measure distance, camped on the shore of the lake and heard groaning and shrieking as if from a man in desperate pain. The work crew, despite Patton's efforts, left for Bra Bedford uh, the next day without completing the survey. Yet another story holds that Dave, oh, I thought his name was David, it's Davis Scobie, unless that's a typo, found a skeleton of a large but young man while preparing the land for his mill. It is not specifically said that there are any haunting elements associated with this discovery, but that would seem appropriate for the lake's name. Finally, one more story. Two hunters set out to hunt and trap near the lake. They would camp together at night, but head out in different directions during the day. One evening, uh, one of the campers failed to return to camp. When the other camper went out to find him the next day, he discovered that his companion had been killed by one of the animals that prowled the area. The surviving hunter headed back for the... It, it just doesn't say anything. So maybe for the land, for to home. Um, the odd thing is that aside from the lake's name and the 18th century reference to the sounds of pain, shrieks, and moans, there is little to indicate that anyone has had weird experiences out here. This is disappointing, but there you go. That said, there is a lengthy list of deaths that occurred, or at least are said to have occurred, at the lake up through the late 19th century. None of them are said to be supernatural, but it will still make you feel somewhat creeped out. Well, as we know, um, where someone dies could be, A, where they're stuck forever. Like, if it's, like, like a murder, for an example, it's, like, th been theorized that perhaps wherever you die, like, it, especially if it's a tragedy, is where your soul is stuck until you can, like, make peace with it or heal from it or, you know, some something like that. Um, or maybe they just wanted to go back because, again, if they if their life was ended and they didn't want it to be, then obviously they might want a little bit of a revenge type of thing. But I guess there haven't been many like actual personal encounters um, other than like hearing the, the shrieks and moans. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, that's enough. Obviously you can't like confirm that it's not somebody that's across the lake or something like that hiding in the trees or whatever um but if you can confirm that like no human physical being is the one shrieking in pain then it probably is the i think it's the a man that died or who was murdered after the argument yeah as if a man is desperate in pain 
is in desperate pain. Anyway, yeah, so that is all I have about lakes. I did not expect this to be such a hard-hitting episode, but it's important to also recognize, like, the history of these haunted grounds because a lot of the times that is what explains the actual haunting of the place. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, I will definitely be doing some more haunted lakes. Um, I'm not sure how soon I'll do it, but an episode I'm planning on doing, um, is the Great Lakes, which is five different lakes, um, up by, like, Michigan area that is said to be haunted, like, all of them. So, we'll do that. I'm not sure when, but if you liked this episode, um, that will be coming out sometime, you know, whenever. Anyway, yes, this is the last episode of the year. Like I said, I'm sad. I'm happy. I'm very happy to start a new year, but that wraps up all things ghostly for 2022. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I know I said that, but let me know down below if you would attend any of these haunted lakes and push the boundaries. Um, I am most interested. I think the, the haunted story that attracts me the most is the lady of the lake, which is Lake Lanier. Um, she just seems very like haunting and very like, I don't know. I feel like that's what I took away from all the ghosts that we heard about in the story. Also the house underwater because that house is still there. I mean, it says that the stuff down there is so eerily preserved. So yeah, that would definitely be cool. Obviously you couldn't see it unless you like scuba dive down there, which no ma'am, no, not for me. Um, but yeah, let me know what you think about these lakes and creepy stories and I will see you guys in my next episode. Goodbye. Goodbye.